Welcome to a structural analysis video from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. In this video, we're going to consider the thickness of the ribs that we want to use specifically for the UWS-4, but it would be applicable to other airplanes that are mostly aluminum construction. And what I'm talking about is an aluminum rib and aluminum skin attached to the rib with rivets. So what I'd like to figure out is what should the thickness of my rib form B. Now the Ultra Cruiser, designed by Maury Hummel, is going to be similar construction to what I'm thinking about using on the UWS-4. Aluminum ribs and aluminum skin. Now on Maury's ribs, he did something interesting. He used three different thicknesses of sheet metal on his ribs, and then he riveted those together. So the truss pieces are 16 thousandths thick aluminum. This nose piece is 16 thousandths thick. It's 6061 T6, but the rib caps, top and bottom, they're 25 thousandths thick aluminum. And then where the rib attaches to the spar web, it is 20 thousandths aluminum. So I often wondered why Mori picked 25 thousandths aluminum for the caps on these ribs. So there's two reasons that come to mind pretty quick. One possibility is that he's relying on the extra strength of the 25 thousandths thick aluminum to have this act as a beam to hold the loads of the skin that are transferred to the rib through the rivets. Because there's going to be, generally on the top, there's going to be a load pulling up, and then on the bottom, there's going to be a load pushing in, typically. So between here and here, it's going to be acting as a beam with the load pushing up on it. Here, it's going to be acting as a beam with the load pulling up on it. So it's got to be stiff enough to hold the shape. At least that's what you would desire. The other possibility that came to mind is that the rivets might be trying to pull through this top cap because of the suction on the skin. Now the rivets have a fairly broad head on them. So I'm not worried about the skin being pulled around the head. These rivets also have something like 150 pounds of tensile strength to them. So I'm not worried about the rivets themselves failing. But the back side of the rib, it's fairly small, and I wonder if it could pull through the rib. Well, that's what we're going to find out in this video. So what I'd like to test is 16 thousandths thick aluminum, because if I can get away with 16 thousandths thick, that should save me some weight. I'm also going to try 20 thousandths aluminum, and if I'm still having troubles, then I'll go to 25 thousandths. So now I need to figure out how I'm going to do this test and what force I need to use in the test. So let's talk about the force first. Using the cord-wise distribution that we've done on a recent video, I calculated that on the foremost rivet, when we're at our maneuvering speed of V sub A, at our maximum angle of attack, with our load factor of 3.8, this rivet up here will have about 20 pounds of suction force pulling up here. So there'll be suction on the skin, that'll be transferred to the rivet coming down to the rib and then that will be transferred into the rib. So that's the force I'm gonna start using. That'd be the worst case scenario. And then I'll also add in a safety factor of 1.5. So that means I'll actually be using a force of 30 pounds. 20 times 1.5 equals 30. Now to do that calculation for 20 pounds, I'm assuming a three inch spacing between the rivets. That's what Moore used. And I'm also assuming 14 and a half inches between ribs. And we'll talk about doing that calculation in another video. So now let's figure out how we're gonna do this test. We need something to act like the skin and then something to act like the flange on the rib. So that's what I've got down here. I've made a number of various pieces to act like the rib and the flange on the rib. So right now I've got some 16 thousandths thick aluminum and some 20 thousandths thick aluminum that we're gonna do this test on. Now here's the test rig I've designed to do this. So up here at the very top, we have a load cell. And the load on that cell is being shown here on this scale. So right now we have 10.4 pounds showing. Then I've got some linkages to help bring it down a little bit lower. Then I've got this here, this kind of U shape. This is gonna act like the skin. And then down here, I have one of these that's gonna act like the rib. There's a rivet coming down through it. Right now I have Clecos in there, but there's a rivet here that's gonna be taking the load. And then I come down here to this little cage where I've got a platform that I can put floor tiles on to put my weight on here. 
So let me take some weight off here. You can see it goes up to about two pounds. That's what all this from right here down weighs from this section here. Although the weight's a little bit more because I have Clecos in here, but when I'm just using rivets, which is what I normally use, it's a little bit less. So my first test is gonna be with 16 thousandths thick rib, and we're gonna take it up to the full load, the 30 pounds, and we'll see what happens. So as I was doing this test, I kind of built up to it gradually. I was kind of curious at how much of deflection I was gonna get on the flange. As load is being put on this flange, it's gonna start deflecting. So I did quite a few measurements as I was slowly adding more and more weight. And as we got up to about the 20 pounds, the amount of deflection was starting to get pretty alarming, at least if this is the way it acted in an actual wing. Now, of course, this flange would be curved to it, so it would be stiffer, so it wouldn't deflect nearly as much. For this flat bend that we got, it's deflecting a lot. And when we get up to 30 pounds, it's deflecting a whole lot. And that brings up another thing that I want to look at, and that's after having a full load put on it with this deflection, will it return back to its normal angle? So then I took all the weight off and I took the fixture completely apart so I could get my fake rib out here and start looking at it. So the first thing I looked at was, did this flange go back to the angle that it originally had? And it did not. It was still deflected, still unbent just a little bit. So that's not really good. But the thing that bothered me the most is that where the rivet came through the flange, that is deformed a lot. And I was not very pleased with that at all. So I really didn't think that was acceptable. So the next thing to do is try to start working towards something that might be acceptable. So then I went to a three inch wide. I should mention that this first one was one and a half inches wide. So then I went to three inches wide, which is probably closer to what reality would be since I'd have three inch spacing on the rivets. So then I went ahead and I did the same test, except I didn't gradually work up to it. I just went straight to a 30 pound load and then removed it. So looking at whether the flange went back to its roughly 90 degree angle on it, it did. So that was kind of nice. So that meant at least with three inch spacing, I shouldn't have to worry about the angle after it's had the 30 pound load on it, not returning back. So it does return back to its original angle. So that's good but the rivet hole is still deformed. And I would expect that. It basically still has the same load coming through that rivet. So that's really expected. So still, this isn't quite good enough as far as the rivet hole goes. I don't like how much it's getting deformed. So the next thing we can think about is what if we don't use three inch spacing? What if we used two inch spacing on our rivets? So that's gonna change the load. That's gonna reduce the load from a maximum of 30 down to 20 pounds. So then I got another piece. Now this happens to be two inches wide and I put a 20 pound load on it. And again, flange went back to its normal angle after being deflected when it had the load on it. And, but the rivet hole, unfortunately, I think still is too deformed. It's still got a lot of deformation in the rivet hole. So that's disappointing. But using that two inch spacing, that reduces our load down to 20 pounds. So we went from 30 pounds at three inch spacing, 20 pounds at a two inch spacing. Now we could try to go down to one and a half or one inch spacing. That would keep reducing the load on the rivet. Eventually we get down to a spacing where we wouldn't have a deformed hole anymore. And, and then keep in mind that maximum load that occurs up here is right at the very nose. So we could do something like a one inch spacing for several inches come back, then go to one and a half, then go to two, then go to three. And then back here on the main rib, we could probably even go up to four inch space if we wanted to because the load drops as we move backwards. So we'd only need that narrow spacing up here at the nose. But I'm not really fond of one inch spacing. That's a lot of rivets. It adds a lot more time to the construction. So what's the next thing? Well, let's go up to a thicker rib. So the next thing I'm gonna try is 20 thousandths thick aluminum. And with this 20 thousandths thick, let's go back to our 30 pound load. That's our 20 pound expected load multiplied by 1.5. Now I'm just using a two inch wide piece. I should really use a three inch wide piece, but this is what I had available. 
So after applying a 30 pound load on this 20,000 stick aluminum, there's still just a little bit of deformation. It's not nearly as much with the 16,000 stick, but there is just a little bit of deformation. And then of course the flange returned back to its 90 degree angle with no problem. So next thing to think about is what if we went down to a two inch spacing? Again, that'd be a 20 pound ultimate load. So for the 25,000 thick rib with 20 pounds of load on it, it still slightly deforms that rivet hole. Not much, but it still slightly deforms it. Now that's with the safety factor of 1.5. What if we take off that safety factor of 1.5? That would take our load down to about 13 and a half pounds, roughly. Let's see what that does. Does that deform the hole? So I went and did that test and looking at that rivet hole, that did not deform the rivet hole. So that tells me then if I do two inch spacing, at least at the very front of that rib with 20,000 thick ribs, especially on the flange at our maximum load, it's not going to deform the rivet hole. But if we add in the safety factor of of 50% more, it does very slightly deform the rivet hole. Now that's actually allowable in part 23. Of course, we don't need to match part 23. We're just using it as a guide. But part 23 says that at your maximum load, you should not have any deformation of anything, but at the ultimate load with the 1.5 safety factor, you can have some deformation. You just can't let it fail. So using that criteria, and using two inch spacing at least for these lead rivets, and then maybe go to two and a half and then maybe three for the remainder. I'll have to do the calculation to verify it. I think that will work. That won't be too many extra rivets. I'll have 20,000 thick flanges instead of 25. That also means that up here, this will be 20 thousandths. That'll make it a little bit heavier than Maury's rib. And if I go with this truss design, and I probably will, I'll be just very slightly heavier for at least this part. Although I plan on making my ribs one part instead of multiple parts. So that means I won't have all these rivets here that Maury has in his design. My guess is my ribs, at least if I had the same airfoil and thickness, my ribs will probably just be very slightly heavier than Maury's are. Maybe. It might come out even. Now there's more to the rivet and hole choices than just this. We also have to have shear. The ribs are going to transfer a shear load, a torsion load to the skins. So the rivets have to be able to carry that load too. So I'm going to have to consider that in another video. Well, that's it guys. I hope you learned a little something. You can also do these tests for your ribs when you design yours too. Thanks a lot for watching. Until next time.